Harry, we come now to the end of this letter, which we've seen may have originally been two letters, but certainly we now come to, I think, the end of the main letter. We're back where we started. Uh, whatever the first part of the letter is, is now concluded in the end. And as is so often the case with Paul, uh, at, at the end of the letter, he brings not exactly down to earth, but into kind of concrete reality, uh, the implications of the claims he's been making about what it is to live in the already and the not yet and to live in the, in the grace of Jesus Christ. And we have these two women now mentioned only once, I think, in all of human history, Euodia and Syntyche, but there they are. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the scripture for as long as life shall remain. Tell mm -hmm. us about Euodia and Syntyche, if you can. Yeah, well, it's interesting to see what, uh, what Paul urges in uh, verse 2 there. He urges them to be of the same mind in the yeah. Lord. Remember the same yeah. mind language back yeah, there in two. chapter 2. Yeah. So I think there's some connection yeah. between those two sections. Uh, we don't know, as you say, anything about these two uh, women, but I think they're of a piece with uh, other women that we know from uh, the Pauline missionary orbit. Uh, people like um, uh, uh, Priscilla, uh, who with her husband Aquila was uh, a missionary, yeah. uh, reported on in Acts and mentioned by Paul in 1 Corinthians uh, and um, mentioned again in, in uh, Romans in the list of greetings, which was probably being sent to Ephesus. Um, another woman in that same list of greetings, Junia, also with her husband right. Andronicus, Paul calls them foremost among the apostles. Yeah, interesting, including Junia. Yeah, right. Not, yeah. yeah. right. Yeah. And then there's uh, Chloe uh, in 1 Corinthians mm. who, whose people come to Paul with a message of what's going on and the questions for him yeah. about uh, certain uh, behavioral matters. Chloe's people, who are they? Members of her household, yeah, probably, yeah, probably, slaves, freedmen. Yeah. This is a woman yeah. of means. Yeah. Yes, um, clearly. And then there's Phoebe, a deaconess at Cancrii, yeah. um, who Paul mentions in, uh, in the conclusion of Romans and who probably received a copy of Romans uh, fairly early on. What's he doing sending something to that woman? Yeah, well, she's yeah. probably heading up the yep, community. Yep. Uh, it's clear, I think, that, that women were playing major leadership roles in a lot of Pauline uh, communities. Uh, the, the fuss about um, uh, how women should um, behave in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 11 yeah. is not about whether they should be praying no, or exactly. prophesying. What, what do they he wear? He assumes that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. He just wants them to do things decently and in order. Absolutely. Right? Yes, absolutely. So uh, I think that UOD and Sintruke uh, are not um, accidental to the story of Philippians. Mm. I think they're playing a major leadership mm. role in this community, mm -hmm. and th they disagree on something. Something, yeah. Uh, it may be just a personality disagreement. It may be on some one of the issues that yeah. Paul has alluded to, you know, whether uh, circumcision or uh, Jewish kashrut laws, which might be behind some of all of these boasting yeah. things that he says in chapter 3, yeah. are on the table there in Philippi. But they, they have some difference of opinion, and he wants to get, get them to, um, uh, to work together. And so he appeals to some third party, too, to help them do so, whether that's Epaphroditus or, uh -huh. or someone. Uh, so he wants them to have the same mind, uh, and he asks you, whoever that is, my loyal yeah. companion, to help these women. Uh, but he appreciates them. Uh, this, the, again, the language of appreciation and uh, yeah, friendship is, uh, runs through Philippians. Yeah, yeah. They have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel. Yeah. So they're not just uh, setting the, the table for the, uh, the uh, coffee and donuts after, after no, services. No, these are serious co-workers. They, they, they are yeah, co-workers. Yeah, yeah. Right. So then we... Go, we end as we began with a, with a strong stress on joy, rejoice, rejoice, mm -hmm. rejoice. Uh, he's in prison. Mm -hmm. He's not sure he's going to be able to visit them again, thanks to Epaphroditus for the gift. But joy seems like a kind of stretch, I think, to most of us. Yeah, joy is something that Paul emphasizes in so many texts. And uh, a call like this to rejoice evokes texts from the Psalms. Mm -hmm. uh, there are so many of the, the Psalms that call for us to rejoice in the Lord. There are prophetic texts that call for us to rejoice in the Lord. So I think Paul in some ways is echoing um, his, his biblical heritage here in calling for rejoicing. But the joy is in something else. It's in um, the citizenship, all the things we were yeah. talking about last yeah. time, the already and the not yet yeah. of Paul's eschatolo eschatological hope. Yeah. Um, rejoice in the experience of being in Christ. Rejoice in the experience of having Christ as the Lord, Christ not the emperor as the Lord. Uh, rejoice in the fellowship that um, uh, is associated with, with celebrating that lordship. Uh, this is what he calls uh, for rejoicing in. Uh, and the joy also clearly has an eschatological uh, foundation here too. So there are kind of two senses, I think, in which Paul uh, evokes um, joy. One is um, the kind of paradoxical joy that you can have even when, uh, when things are going badly, 
because you have a grounding, you have a relationship, you have a, a connection with something more fundamental than any suffering you're engaging in. And there's also the joy that will displace suffering, okay. uh, the joy that's to come. Yeah. And when he says the Lord is near, I think he's pointing to that uh, hope too, that hopeful joy okay. in the end. So um, Paul is big on joy, there's yeah. no doubt about that, uh, and he, he's, uh, he's echoing a biblical tradition here, but doing so on the basis of his own theological grounding and uh, his experience of Christ and his hope for the consummation in Christ. And then he goes on with the, the, his second finally, Mm -hmm. or why we may have two letters. He, he has many finally. Finally, ones. finally. Mm -hmm. Now, really finally, folks. Uh, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just. What, what's think about, think about these things seems a little thin to me. Mm -hmm. I think about all kinds of things I never do. What's, that can't be what he means. Yeah. Um, it, this little paragraph is, is, um, is of a piece with a lot of other um, endings of Paul where he all, wants to offer some word of exhortation, some word yeah. of encouragement. Uh, and it often has a little ethical twist. In Galatians, there's a lot of an ethical, ethical twist, twist because yeah. it, it's an issue on the table. Yeah. It's, uh, his lawless gospel, uh, something that uh, absolves people from ethical responsibilities. Right. He says, no, no, and he gives some examples. Uh, or in, uh, in Romans, he'll go on quite a bit about certain ethical issues that apparently were controversial. But ethics is always there. Behavior yeah. is always there. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, a little bit of exhortation to keep on doing the things you've learned and received and heard and seen in me uh, is something that Paul um, engages in here. Um, but again, it's in this spirit of, of uh, this very positive spirit that pervades so much of, of, um, of Philippians, uh, because it includes here, and the God of peace will, will, will be with you. Yeah. So live life well as you've learned for me to do, and uh, life will be good, yeah. however tough it may be. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and then, so often, dialectics, too fancy word, but so often Paul does the on the one hand, not the other hand. So here we've got content, but hungry. What, what's he talking about in terms of, he tells us what he's rejoicing in, in terms of his own life and mm -hmm. what his apostleship looks like. And I suspect maybe saying, here's a model for you once again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we, we've uh, had some sense uh, throughout uh, where Paul has alluded to sufferings that the congregation might yeah. be engaged in. Yeah. And we've speculated a little bit that it might have something to do with their uh, social status or ostracism from right. uh, this heavily uh, Roman community yeah. in Philippians. And Paul is giving them a rationale for uh, maintaining uh, that status of distance and uh, absorbing whatever hits they're taking because of their new commitments. So... Uh, yeah, it's, it's encouragement to keep on doing that and also an affirmation that you can rejoice in this uh, kind of situation. Okay, so looking back now, we come to the conclusion of this letter. Uh, starts in friendship, ends in friendship, bumps along a little bit along the way. Uh, there's some kind of worries about false teaching, some kinds of worries about, false perse about persecution, real persecution, some kind of worries about citizenship. But my sense at the end is at the beginning is that this is a letter written in love to a congregation in which he has pretty much full confidence. Yeah, and a congregation that has given him support. Yeah. And I think one little practical issue that he finally is uh, dealing with in a kind of subtle and indirect way here is um, whether he needs more support. Yeah. Uh, he had and what does he do with that one? Yeah, he had received uh, something, as we recall, from Epaphroditus, yeah. and Epaphroditus is mentioned here again. And the fact that uh, Epaphroditus brought gifts from them is mentioned again yep. in verse 18. Yep. So he wants to reiterate his thankfulness yep. to, to the uh, community for their past support. Um, but uh, he was also wants to indicate that they don't have to do anything more. Yeah. Right? Heaven forbid you should think of me at this time. Right. Yes. Not, not that I'm referring to being in need, he says in <laughs> verse 11. For I've learned to be content with yeah. whatever little I yeah. have. Yeah. So it may well be that they will send him something more, but it's their free will offering. Yeah, it's yeah. not something that, uh, that he's asking for. And he for. does not demand at this he's point. He's not either. demanding, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. He's very careful about that in uh, so many places. He, uh, he talks about that in 1 Corinthians 9, um, uh, where he says, I have had the right to get support from uh, yeah. congregations, but I, I didn't, didn't exercise yeah. that right. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, it's also an issue in dealing with the uh, Corinthians in, in 2 Corinthians. Um, in uh, 11 and 12 where he's talking about um, uh, they, they seem to be taking umbrage at the fact that he hasn't been taking salary they from do. them. Right, right. And he says, just not, I don't do it that yeah. way. Right? Yeah. So he wants to position himself in such a way as not to, uh, not to uh, be obliged to 
uh, congregations yeah. uh, or not to be in a position that could be construed as um, uh, above them in some way, demanding yeah. some sort of uh, uh, support from them. Uh, no, if they're going to offer him something, it's their free will, and he doesn't need it. So he wants. Well, to and, it. and it goes very back to the very beginning that this is partnership in the gospel. There'll be other places, other letters, where he pulls out, "I'm the apostle, and you're the people." But here we are. We are God's mm -hmm. people. He's got fellow workers. He's got fellow Christians. He's got fellow hopers. He's got fellow believers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you think about this uh, business of asking and giving and all of that, this is one letter where the the um, Pauline collection that he was taking up for the church right. in, um, in Jerusalem is, is not on the table. Uh, maybe it's yeah. not because he's in prison and can't do anything yeah. about it. Uh, or maybe it's because it's over, if this is from a Roman imprisonment, uh, unlikely, but possible. Yeah. In any case, um, he's, he's not asking for money at this point, as he so often is with his other congregations. Uh, when in, in my years as a pastorate, I three times retired from, resigned from the church where I was, and every time the last text was always Philippians, thankful for your partnership in the gospel from the first day till now, because I think in some ways it's his most pastoral and loving letter, and if you're feeling, you ought to be feeling good about the place you're leaving, and if you do, it's a great text. Right, well, he certainly is on good terms with these people and uh, had a lot of affection for them. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir.